in the beginning. That's how it was. We're going to, we've come down to this 36th chapter where Esau and Jacob have, have greeted each other and they're both settled here in the land of Canaan. And in this 36th chapter, it's basically the generations of Esau, which, um, you know, Esau never talked to our father. But, and yes, it is true that he would live away from the fat of the land. So in this 36th chapter, I'm going to kind of talk you through it, and then we'll pick it up in the 40th verse to have the names of the dukes. Um, and um, other than that, I'll talk you through it. In the sixth verse, when we come along to Esau's offspring, it was too crowded for he and Jacob, now Israel, to both be at the same place. They both were too rich, had too many cattle. So Esau took his everything he had, his wives, his cattle, and he pushed off uh, away from uh, that area. And so it was, we know where he would end up at, in Rush or Russia. And uh, the 38th chapter of Ezekiel declares that. And it goes on about his wives, and his wives were Hittites and Ishmaelites, unfit for the um, string of, of uh, Adamic people, because they weren't Adamic, for the Christ child to be born. So that's why it's not all that important other than to be able to identify the Edomites, which Edomite means red, and it's the red nation of today. So having said that, um, he continues on and speaks of who he married and their offspring. But we come down to the dukes, which is about the equivalent of the patriarchs of, um, of um, Jacob's family. And we'll pick it up then in verse 40, and let's go with it with a word of wisdom from our father. Verse 40, chapter 36, and it reads, And these are the names of the dukes that came of Esau according to their families, after their places, by their names, Duke Timna, Duke Alva, Duke Jephthah, and verse 41, Duke Aholabama, and Duke Elah, Duke Pinan, and 42, then we come with Duke Kenaz, Duke Timon, Duke Mibzar, verse 43, to complete the chapter and the dukes, 43 reads, Duke Magdiel, Duke Iram, these are the dukes of Edom, according to their habitations in the land of their possession. He is Esau, the father of the Edomites. And of course, the Edomites are the red nation. And you follow them by that. They, um, naturally, we find also in history, not, not Bible history, but his, man's history, that King Kagan of the Khazars would ultimately end up in the land of the Edomites. And that's why you find many of the Kenites intermixed with the Edomites even to this day. So having said that, let's pick it up then in verse 37 as we take it back up with Jacob. And we have a 17-year-old little Joseph here that will be introduced. Chapter 37, the great book of Genesis, verse 1. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Verse 2, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, and with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. In other words, they were kind of griping and complaining. Joseph loved his father, and he kind of, uh, who, who would these sons be that, that he, he squealed on? It would be Dan, Neptala, Gad, and Asher. That's who those children would have been. And the 17-year-old, he told his dad about it, and naturally, you know how many points that's going to make to have a stool pigeon in your midst. And, but Joseph was not, in the sense, a stool pigeon. He just loved his father. And he wanted them, his father to know what they were saying. 
verse 3. Now, and, and let me call to your mind, Joseph was the son of Rachel, whom our father, who, who the father loved very much. Okay, it was his favorite wife. Verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. Now, this in itself is kind of an affront to the other brothers. Why? Well, here's this little 17-year-old. This coat of many colors is a coat that's either worn by the chief, that's the head of the, head of the family, or the heir to inherit the throne of the family. So this in itself is an affront to the other brothers. Verse 4, And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. He, he just was not a popular um, kid. And, and rightfully so, I, I guess the father kind of brought this on this boy. But also, our Heavenly Father has his hand on this boy. This, this boy will be the salvation ticket to all of these other brothers before all is said and done. For he will, when the great famine comes, he will have had been in a position of much power in Egypt and will save his brethren. Verse 5, of course, they do not know that at this time. Verse 5, and Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Now, where did this dream come from? It came from our father. Verse 6, and he said unto them, here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. Verse 7, For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood around about and made obeisance uh, to my sheaf. In other words, they were all bowing to me. Now, th this is not the way to win friends and influence people. Sometimes when Father gives you something, it's best to keep it to yourself if, there, if it would cause a point of contention or jealousy or somebody not to understand. Simply, usually when a message is given, it's given to you only anyway. It's something you're supposed to do or accomplish and be that as it may. But here, God is talking to this lad, letting him know beforehand how important he's going to be to the people as far as saving them. And they will respect him and love him when all is said and done. Verse 8, And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. He, he was becoming more unpopular with his brothers all the time. Verse 9, and he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and he said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And of course, that's the eleven, and he was the twelfth uh, star of the zodiac. And uh, naturally, this is uh, the sun and the moon. I mean, we're traveling high cotton here. Verse 10, and he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? Um, in other words, that went over about like a hair in a biscuit. Just even with Jacob, it, I mean, Israel, it was not popular that Joseph, but little old Joseph, he's 17, and God is dealing with him. And naturally, God has a purpose in this. It, it's difficult sometimes to understand all things when you're living it, other than to always realize we're in a real world. And if you love the Father and you're serving him, 
He's going to move you if you're destined where he wants you. And that's what he's doing with this young Joseph. Though it will cause his brothers to turn against him to the point that they will sell him. Even at one point wanted to murder him. But that very deed itself is the salvation, brings about the salvation of the 12 tribes. So he's got the whole clan kind of stirred up at him here. Verse 11, and his brother, brethren envied him. But his father observed the saying. He tucked it away. I mean, he was used to God speaking to him also. Verse 12. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. That, that's the back, and, and that's where um, they had uh, gained the ground from having killed off um, the people that took Diana. Verse 13. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. I I'm ready. I'll do it. I'm ready to go check on them. And he wasn't afraid of anything. Verse 14. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, and see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring the word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. He, he made that trip. Uh, naturally, when he gets there, his brother's going to be gone. Verse 15, And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in a field, 17 years old, out there wandering around all by himself. And the man asked him, saying, What seeketh thou? 16, and he said, I seek my brother, and tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. If the parent, he thought this person would know his brethren. They must have been that well known in this area. And, uh, and certainly he didn't have to identify them. 17, and the man said, they are departed hence. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan, Dothan. And uh, Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan, which uh, th this word means uh, two wells, evidently looking for more water, to, to water this huge herd that they were taking care of. Unfortunately for Joseph, um, this place is on a road where, where um, uh, caravans are on their way through to Egypt with goods and commercial wares, and not such good people traveling the road. Verse 18. And when they saw him afar off, and they've got that bright coat, here it comes, coat of many colors, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. They are truly bitter at him. That uh, Slaying your own brother is quite a, quite, um, a step. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh, this master of dreams, because they were always putting them down and building him up. Verse 20, Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Let's just get this over with. Verse 21. And Reuben, this would be the senior, the oldest brother, he heard it. And he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. I mean, he, he knew what this would do to his father. It would break his heart. Verse 22. And Reuben said unto them, shed no blood. But cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might that he might rid that um, he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. He was stalling for time to put him in this holding place. Evidently, there was a dry cistern. There might have been two wells there, but there was also one dry cistern because they threw him in it. 
and Reuben's trying to save his brother's life here. God intervenes in many ways. And um, in, in the case of that genealogy through which Christ would come, there's not too many accidents. Verse 23, And it came to pass, when Joseph was coming to his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors, and was on him. That, uh, and uh, so that was on him. 24, And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. I'm sure old Joseph was saying, what in the world have I done now? He's probably wondering, because in his mind, he, all he was doing was reporting the truth. His father's the one that gave him the coat of many colors. And, um, and the dream came from Almighty God, and he was telling the truth. And, and I'm sure it would cause a little wonderment, would it not? Verse 25. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites. This, this is the, the children of Hagar, Arabs, came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And um, uh, we, um, and certainly uh, here you go, and and so it is. Verse 26. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? What good is that going to do us? Verse 27. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let's sell him to the Arabs. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh and his brethren were content. That sounds like a good deal. Let's just do it that way. Verse 28, sharpen up for me. And you need to put it in gear right here or you're going to get lost. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen. And they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now, not a price of a slave is 30 pieces of silver. They only got 20. But why you had to sharpen up is there were they're passed by Midianites. That would be the offspring of Abraham by Keturah. But yet at the same time, it would say they sold him to the Ishmaelites, which would be of Ishmael, the Arabs. So let it be known in your mind, I have taught you well, I hope, that just because somebody lives in an area whereby the Midianites control it, they can still be Ishmaelites and live there and still be called by that name geographically only. Because definitely it has, it has uh, in two places given witness that these are Arabs. Sold him to the Arabs. They're going to take him down to Egypt where there are more Arabs. 29. And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. He knew this was going to kill his father, that he was going to be, it would just break his heart. Verse 30. And he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? How are we going to handle this? Verse 31, And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And uh, certainly um, to deceive the father, of course. You know, you want to remember God is in this. As cruel as it may sound, it is still God's plan. For this lad will still be the Savior, and, a, and a, type of, a type of Savior, which means a type of Christ, if you would, that uh, he will save the other brethren before it's over with. But how, how real life can be. Verse 32, And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father, and said, This have we found, and know now whether whether it be thy son's coat or not, or no. 
they knew whose coat it was. But they're asking the father, can you identify this? Is this his coat? Making out as though they had never seen him. They just simply found the coat. And he knew it. Naturally, the father knew it. And he said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. 34. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. It was a terrible thing that, that had happened to him. This being his favorite. It, it is a bad thing to have favorites. It truly is. And that's a mistake you never want to make. Verse 35, And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And he was. He was really tore up. He was sad. It is strange, but there will come a day that he will reclaim this son, and all will be well. And this son, again, would save the rest of the brethren. Verse 36, And the Midianites sold him un into Egypt unto Potiphar, Potiphar the, an officer of Pharaoh's and a captain of of the guard. Um, part of our means belonging to the son. He's a heathen naturally. And, um, and he's a very high official. Some of these are executioners even. Uh, and uh, the captain of the guard, the guard would do this. Very rich, no doubt. And, um, and it's quite, a, quite impressive. And God always sees to it that he's placed where God would want him in a, in a position whereby he can go nowhere but up. But at the same time, um, I, you, I would have you know that the Midianites by geographical location only because they were Ishmaelites, as it is made clear in this chapter in two other places. So, there you have it. Joseph sold unto the Arabs. The Arabians have him. He is now in Egypt, and uh, we will read more naturally of him as time goes by. Chapter 38 um, is a chapter in as much as uh, Judah is part of the lineage through which the Christ child shall come. You find one of the most important places where God intervenes to see that the bloodline is kept clean and clear of Adamic people and blood through that genealogy, which it would be of Judah and Levi that the child would come after the order of Melchizedek. But here we see that Judah was, um, he had some bad habits, really bad habits. Why? Well, let's look into it. Verse, chapter 38, verse 1. And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren in other words, he left his own kind and turned in to a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira, and meaning a noble race, not noble in that sense. Verse 2, And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, it means wealth, okay, and, and he took her and went in unto her. Judah kind of had a time at sheep shearing time. He kind of went bad. Okay. Verse 3, And she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. Uh, this is uh, Judah through which the Christ child is supposed to come. He's married this Canaanite woman. Bad as Esau. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. It means strong. And uh, verse 5, 
And she yet again conceived and bare a son and called his name Chela, which means petition. They're going to need one. And he was at uh, Chizeb. This Chizeb means lying or a falsehood, rightfully called, when she bare him. Verse 6, And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Tamar means the palm tree, and she said she's a good Adamic daughter. And, and is supposed to be part of the lineage through which Christ would come. And here he has married her off to one that is, is not of the true tribe of Judah, but of this Canaanite woman in Judah. Not good. Verse 7, And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. Just, I mean, took him. This, God is protecting the seed line. You got it? A lot of people have trouble with that, but never mind. Had God not intervened and kept the line pure, whereby we have a Savior, there would be a lot of lost people in this world with no hope. So God's love for his children pours forth when he protects the lineage. It means we have a Savior. And only but by the grace of God for keeping the line pure, because you sure couldn't count on Judah. God can keep it straight. Verse 8. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. Now, this was the way that God had instilled and the way of the Israelites. It certainly wasn't the way of the heathen. And this boy is a heathen, though Judah might be his father from Canaanite. Verse 9, And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass, he didn't, he, evidently he and his brother did not get along. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground lest that he should give seed to his brother. Just 10. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord. Wherefore, he slew him also. I mean, took him out, protecting Tamar. Verse 11. Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also, and his brethren, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Now, Judah's lion, he has no intention of giving Selah to Tamar. Uh, two, one thing, there would be quite a bit of difference in the age, and no doubt after losing two, he's a little concerned, verse 12. And in process of time, the daughter of Su uh, uh, Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up unto his sheep shares, and there he goes again, to Timnath, and the portion, he and his friend Hira, the Adullamite. When those two get together, it's usually not too good. 13. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to share his sheep. She, she knew what was about to happen. 14. And she put her widow's garments off from her, and covered, and covered her with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath, 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 for she saw that Sheila was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. In other words, Judah was lying to her. Verse 15, she's going to use a little covert activity here. 15, and when Judah saw her 
he thought her to be a harlot. She was dressed like one because she had covered her face, 16. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, and let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? What, 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 what do you intend to pay me with? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? In other words, I, there's no credit cards given here. He said, I, I, she said, I want something in hand that I can prove that uh, you owe me. 18. And he said, what pledge shall I give thee? And she said, listen to this. Boy, is she sharp. Thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it her and came in into her, and she conceived by him. Now, what I, what I want you to know what Tamar has done here, do you know what a signet is? It's a ring where you seal your authority. That's, that's so that the seal of Judah is there, and it, it means that's, that's his, he, he can, that's like signing, you have the right to sign a check, okay? And the bracelets of the head of the house and his staff, which is what he rules with, a signet of uh, or a, 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 um, a uh, thing that would show that he's the ruler, his staff. So she's called for the right things, and she has them in her custody. There can't be any doubt about who's who and what's what. Well, we're out of time. We'll pick this up in the next lecture.